think atheists are like oppressed widely and largely like there's some weird shit people have said but like just this idea that just who I am is gonna hurt somebody's feelings sucks yeah yeah, yeah. it's it's like someone's like oh do you like Game of Thrones and I'm like ah you know I I, I like the early seasons and the last season though and then they start weeping uh-huh. that's what it's like to be an atheist the last <laughs> seasons are amazing you're an asshole you watch my grandmother was Daenerys she died <laughs> for you <laughs> God awful movie 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 Welcome back to God awful movies where each week we watch another terrible movie so you don't have to. I'm your host Keith Enright and I'm joined by the eminently redoubtable Eli Bosnick. Eli, how's it going? I'm fantastic, Keith, though. Great. This is a get ahead, so I don't know how I actually am when you're hearing this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure I cheer you up right before we release this so <laughs> that you are indeed fantastic. I'll jingle some stuff for you. We'll play some games. All right, buddy? Appreciate it. I could cool. be dead. What if I'm All dead? All right. And also, back by very popular demand, we have veteran guest maskist from the Friendly Atheist podcast, Jessica Bloomkey Greif. Jessica, welcome back. Oh, thank you so much for having me back on, boys. This was a treat. Wasn't it? <laughs> so, as I understand it, we, we had you watch uh, a movie about a computer and that's it? It's just like looking at a computer last time? Well, so far you've said movie and about, so I'm going to stop you twice. It <laughs> okay, is fair. neither movie nor is it, is it about anything in particular. All right. Well, we gave you another fantastic one. So, uh, tell us about it. What are we going to be breaking down today? So we watched A Teenage Conflict. It is a 1960s pro-Christian propaganda film. Yes, it is. About God, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough one. It's about, again, we, I might have to stop you at about, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> it's about how learning is bad. <laughs> I... I think it's anti-science, but it doesn't seem to be specifically anti-science, just pro christian I don't know. Unclear. Okay. I think we're going to have to do a deep breakdown of this. I think we will. Jessica said she prayed on it before we started. <laughs> I did, because I got the fun task of trying to summarize this stupid pile of garbage. <laughs> and, I, you yeah. know, I just, I'm your guest. You shouldn't make me work that hard. Yeah, normally I, I have to do that part. And I was like, yeah, Jessica's doing this. <laughs> it's the story of blank. I don't know. You figure it out. <laughs> Fucking horrible. <laughs> All right. And Eli, this is a lot easier. How bad was this? Movie, whatever you want to call it. Yes, it is. Well, if you love Jesus, but real to real videos of a nerd at a blackboard has torn your worldview asunder, you will love this movie. <laughs> All right. And is there anything you'd like to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? I'm going to say it's the best, worst use of every single logical fallacy there is. <laughs> yeah, they, they really hit a lot of them like they oh, have yeah. just a checklist and they go right through. They have a lightning round at the end just to make sure they cover them all. <laughs> yeah. And the problem of evil appears maybe five or ten times in their checklist, especially mm-hmm. at the end. Real big. Yeah. <laughs> I would say an appeal to authority is sort of the thesis to this particular movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, certainly a better title than a teenage conflict. Yeah. Right? A I, it's higher just, it's, authority. From the title down, it was rough, rough stuff. <laughs> All right. I was going to go with best worst understanding of what a computer is. So the one you watched last time dealt with this too. This could have been the best worst for that maybe. Was it in fact? Yeah, maybe, we, have maybe. A, we have a theme going. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. in this one, there's a claim that some really smart guy is building some kind of supercomputer brain. Mm-hmm. The movie's in 1960 though. So that's a punch card situation. That's a he calculator. A calculator. Yeah. yeah, that's what that's doing. They keep talking about it. Or he has a building sized computer somewhere out there that we don't know about. Yeah. Ooh. Right. And see, I was going to go with best worst villain. So the context of this short film is really important. Okay. This movie is almost certainly made in response to the rising popularity of the articles and work of physicist Richard Feynman, who 
a lot of people consider to be America's first great science communicator. I mean, he was really among the first American intellectuals to make incredibly complicated scientific concepts understandable to lay people who had no interest in science. So the Richard Feynman lectures that were taped the year this movie came out would be, without a doubt, the progeny of stuff like Cosmos. And anytime Christianity meets learning things you can understand, it's going to go badly. Progenitor? When you add to that the fact that Feynman was an avowed atheist and probably a communist, you have this movie. <laughs> right. The Christian version of having an argument you lost on Twitter over again in the shower. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, so those Feynman lectures came out and Christian families freaked the fuck out and that's why we have this movie. That's that's what happened? What's even better is Feynman was just getting popular when they made this movie. The tapes weren't even like widely spread yet. They were just like, I hear there's a professor who people like at Caltech. We better make a movie in case anyone sees this Jew. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So that's what they did. Well, I think we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back to tell you all about that. All about a teenage conflict. Go on, open it. Just give me a second. Just give me a second. Now, now, this this is from both of us. That's right. This is from both of us. You guys, what? Ah, oh, just because it's my birthday? Is that what this is? Your fortieth birthday. The big four zero, big guy. <laughs> yep. Birthday. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, all right. Uh, oh, it's uh, it's brand cereal. Yeah, that's right, buddy. That stuff is the best. Oh, dude, you'll be able to eat off your colon. You really uh, will. Okay. Well, I mean, first of all, horrifying image. Second of all, healthy breakfast doesn't have to be so boring. It doesn't? Thanks to Magic Spoon cereal, it doesn't. It's got zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, four net grams of carbs, and only 140 calories a serving. It's gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. Plus, you can build your own box or get a variety pack with available flavors cocoa, Fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, and cinnamon. Wow, that sounds delicious. They are delicious. Plus, they just introduced their super popular maple, waffle, and cookies and cream flavors. Those sound amazing as well. They are. I got them back in the day, and I am so pumped they're back in stock. Okay, so where can I get some of this healthy cereal that doesn't look or taste like packing tape? Yeah, it, it doesn't at all. So just go to magicspoon.com slash gam grab your delicious cereal and try it today and be sure to use our promo code gam at checkout to save five dollars off your order and magic spoon is so confident in their product it's backed with a 100 percent happiness guarantee so if you don't like it for any reason they'll refund your money no questions asked remember get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash gam and use the code gam to save five dollars thanks to magic spoon for sponsoring this episode all right heath well I guess it looks like we got to figure out something else to do for your birthday, huh? Yeah. Yeah, maybe something that's not related to, you know, how old I am or like a secret jab at me as a person or my colon. Oh, there's a tushy ad coming up later in the episode. Oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. I know just, just the thing. All right. Okay, everyone, if you could just finish up your thick T-bone steaks and your four scotches that we all had for lunch and light up your cigarettes, we'll get started writing this movie. Mine is menthol. Health nuts, what are you going to do? Anyway, gang, the truth is there's too much science out there. First, the Ruskies put a refrigerator up in the firmament. Who knows what's coming next? Think how many angels they could have knocked over. Every stinking night, Nick. I think of it every stinking night. We need a film for the kids that makes it clear that science is great and all, but God is the real maloink. The cat's pajamas. Exactly. So here's the way I see it. We make a movie about this fancy scientist, right? You. Nick? Sorry, sorry, instincts. You, it sounded nope, like you were describing. That's what yeah. you were describing. Okay. Anyway, this scientist, he's going to come to town, and these kids are sure he's just going to kill God with Lenin's own sickle. Oh, my. Too intense? No, I just had a baby. Gross. See, this is why women can't be in the workplace. I, I said, oh, my. Anyway, he shows up, right? But instead of giving them the who's gal, he's just wild about Jesus. And science proves how hoinky maloinky Jesus is. Gee, that's swell, Frank. What a picture. All right. Now, what say we pledge allegiance to the flag and put this thing on paper? Can I have the rest of the afternoon off to recover? No, you cannot. Ah, banana oil. <laughs> 
And we're back. And we learn right away from the title screen that we're about to learn atomic physics from a Christian movie. So (laughs) buckle the fuck in. I was immediately stoked when I saw this screen because this is the kind of 60s propaganda film that The Simpsons promised me. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. When a cross and an atom are sharing screen time, you know it's going to be good. Oh, I was so happy about it. (laughs) Also, music note here, asbestos, the baby bottle of the future. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Nice little Saturday at Woolworths going on with some asbestos (laughs) bottle buying. And it it felt (laughs) just felt like a wholesome sitcom about Christian particle physics, like, doo, doo, mm-hmm. boo, you know, <laughs> yeah, honey, is that my proton? <laughs> it's the city on the grow. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And this is where we meet our two teenage protagonists. Again, this is made in the 1960s. So the boy is 25 mm-hmm. and the girl is 33. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. The boy gets a name and the girl doesn't. Yep. The boy is Joe. And I think maybe his sister gets named eventually. I'm not positive. Does anybody have a name for her in their head? No, and I watched it twice. <laughs> so and I. the second time was an hour ago. So rough. Okay. So well, that would be there. A sister walks in and a brother is downstairs in their basement fiddling with his electronics that we find out he's trying to listen to a Russian satellite transmission. I might not have been paying close enough attention. I can only remember that like the big headphones, but I don't know what he was like fiddling with or what those headphones were attached to. So he's listening Great for questions. Sputnik. Yeah. That's what he's supposed to be doing is listening for Sputnik. Yeah. Like Sputnik was passing close enough overhead at this point. This is, a, I guess, a couple of years after Sputnik launched. So they were, they had radio signals coming down from it. So you could catch them if you were good. Okay. Yeah. You'll have to forgive me because my knowledge of Russian space programs is limited. <laughs> Well, Noah was a teenager when this came out. And he assures us that all the cool kids were tracking Sputnik in their afternoons as soon as they got home from school. I know this seems like a very wholesome thing for a teenage boy to be doing with his time. I guess. Yeah. yeah. All things considered, because he could have been throwing like rocks at minorities. That's, I think, the other option <laughs> well, they had in the 60s. That was an intramural sport when yeah. this movie came out. They had to cut that from the movie when they panned over to his friends. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, he's listening to Sputnik and then their youth pastor or is he just their Christian friend? Uh, that mm, Okay, so really say. the main conflict I had while watching this movie was trying to understand who was supposed to be adults and who was supposed to be children. That's a great, no that's a great problem to have with this film. Yeah. <laughs> well, because the guy who plays Fred is like 35 years old and so is the guy who plays Joe who's supposed to be a high school student. Like they're all 35. They just don't understand that there are ages in the world and they just cast actors. They don't care. Yeah, Yeah. it's very weird. Whoever he's supposed to be, he comes by and he's like, hey, we haven't seen you guys in church in a while and they blow him off because they're too busy. And Fred reacts to them saying they don't want to come to youth fellowship like they're fucking his daughter. It's bizarre. It's pretty great. (laughs) Well, and specifically from from the point of view of like, well, it takes up a lot of time and it's kind of old fashioned. He's like, what? <laughs> oh. <laughs> old fashioned? You're, you're too busy for God. Yeah, that's cool. You'll, you'll be fine. You'll be fine in the future. It's it's all good. And he's super passive aggressive about he's that. He's so for the passive rest of the movie. aggressive. So at passive one point, aggressive. he's like, is this because of that science club you're in at school? And they're like, I mean, yeah, you know, our the head of our science club, Sid Thorpe. And he's like, Sid fucking Thorpe. There are eight million deleted takes somewhere on a cutting room floor where he calls Sid Thorpe a Jew. And this movie <laughs> contains the one take where he did not call Sid Thorpe a Jew. I like that Joe specifically says, I was talking to my friend Sid Thorpe. You know, Sid Thorpe, our friend Sid. Like, you know, Not one of the many other Sidneys that we all know, specifically <laughs> Sid Thorpe. Hey, this was 1960, Heath. Every fourth baby was named Sidney uh, or Herbert. And then they stopped and never did it again. <laughs> Well, considering that the daughter sister character doesn't even get a name and we're full naming a man we have not seen yet is really (laughs) indicative of how they view human women. And I love how the like the folly of the scientific hubris here. So here are the scientifically hubristic things that Joe is going to say. Shouldn't our religious ideas stand up under a scientific approach and either a thing is true or it isn't. And this movie's like, no, there's a 
there's another thing in between those two, you yeah, asshole. It's what's interesting is basically every argument he makes is like something I would probably make in the year of our Lord 2021. Of like, <laughs> I would like to base my life on things that I can prove and things that are physically there, and that's pretty important to me, but. And apparently I could have made that argument in 1960 when my dad was 11 yep. and still have, like, made a good dent there. Yeah, and been as ignored as that <laughs> argument will be today. Yeah, but Fred gets, again, super passive-aggressive mad about that argument because Joe mentions, like, oh, at Science Club, which I go to, you know, we kind of have a an idea that we should check on things with science, including the Bible. So, you know what? The Bible turns out to be wrong about, like, Everything we check. I'm not trying to be a dick, but that's just what happens. <laughs> and Fred's like, okay, well, uh, the science experts that you get to talk at your science club, does that make them like authorities about things? And Joe's like, yeah, that, yeah. that's exactly yeah. what it does. That's what Are you learning, what but in means. an angry tone of voice? It seems like you're just <laughs> learning true things, but you're saying it, Matt. Well, I guess I've got to open the door before I walk through it. Okay, Fred. No, you know what? You know what? No, you don't. You're right. You're, you do not have to do that. Don't check. Also, real quick, can we talk about Fred's tooth situation? Ooh. He had a sour face is how I would yeah, describe it. He had it. a very sour, resting sour face. Resting for sure. sour face. He has teeth that make one think that they didn't quite get the balance of fluoride correct in the water for the first <laughs> however many years they were doing it. Yeah. Like he was in the like he got brainwashed first push, but he didn't yeah. get the good dental not the effects of the brainwashing from no. the fluoride. But also maybe a few extra. He, well, yeah, he definitely. Okay, so maybe he, didn't, he got some of the advantages, including six extra rows of bottom teeth like a shark like a shark yeah, yeah exactly which was cool which matches dead eyes yeah <laughs> exactly he, he looks a lot like a shark actually like a shark <laughs> ate a sour patch kid you're picturing fred right now like a like a shark turned to jesus after a life of chomps and now is like weirdly bossy about it and you're like hey man didn't you chomp a bunch of people and the shark is like well i'm all about the lord now and you're not religious so you're like i don't know man you just seem like someone who's chomped a lot and he's like oh read this pamphlet and anyways do you so, have a minute to talk about no <laughs> no no our no. lord and chopper jesus christ <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh just jaws but when the shark pops up he's got a pamphlet a chick tract oh <laughs> god if every time you were, you were about to get talked to by one of those people it was like Duh, Duh. No. oh my god certainly how i feel when they approach <laughs> So yeah, Fred storms through the door, asks them to talk to the pastor, which means we're going to head upstairs where mom and dad... Wait, before we go hang out with mom and dad, I would just like to posit a theory I'm working on. So at one point, Joe says, I'm not going to build my future on something I can't prove. And I would like to posit that this is actually the first act of like, a Hallmark Christmas movie where you have the cynical city girl who refuses to believe in the magic of Christmas anymore. Yes. So in this speech, I am going to try to theorize that this movie is, in fact, the uh, the rough outline of a modern day Hallmark Christmas movie. Let's see how long I can keep that bit up. Oh, like I'll rom -com. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hallmark right. shitty Christmas rom-com. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's going to fit. Which I don't want to brag. I'm an expert in. I yeah. minored in shitty <laughs> rom-coms. The science notebook. Pin yeah. in the board. <laughs> Sorry. So with the framework all set out, uh, we're going to head upstairs where mom and dad have some news. Their super smart science person neighbor, George Cooper, is coming to town. <laughs> this, this family dinner conversation is the best. So it starts out, they're just like, oh, hey, Joe, how's your... Uh, satellite tracker going past the dinner jello and so you know they're just doing like <laughs> that's what they have on the table no they're having savory dinner jello yep, very clearly savory dinner jello yeah yeah and then they mentioned that george cooper's coming to town he's making a supercomputer to prove that god exists that's what the parents think because yeah. they are evangelical christians this is the first mention of heath's best worst they say quote he's gonna put an electronic brain into the computer center. <laughs> Again, that's a calculator. When he says electronic brain, that's it's like a 1960. That's an abacus mm -hmm. 
but bigger, made of punch cards. <laughs> but on the bright side, George Cooper is a distinctly Gentile name. So yeah. kind of stepping away from the anti-Semiticism. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. They tried calling him like Merv Freiburg for a couple of takes. And <laughs> yeah, for sure. Everyone at the table kept screaming Jew. They were like, you know what? After the first scene with Fred, we got to redo this. Yeah. We were already pushing it with Sid. Thorpe. George Cooper, yeah. Jew. Uh, sorry. Okay, I'll get it this time. I'll get it this time. Now I, I can hear. I just knew from before that it was... It was Merv something Jew. I also love at one point they mention how old George is. They say, oh, yeah, he's pretty old now. He's 31. And I just wrote in my notes. How do you like that, Jessica and Heath? Huh? Pretty old at 31. You're well, over 31. Whatever. I was going to say, am. like, this man is 40 and like, oh, my God, 31 is the oldest age I've ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get an amusing anecdote about George. I was in love with this because it was really indicative of the way, like, not just this movie, but so many Christian movies don't know anything about science and don't want to get, like, drilled down in too many specifics in Christianity because they want to paint with a broad brush. Yeah. So what we are left with is lines like, he tried to kill the weeds scientifically. <laughs> <laughs> they might as well say cyberly, like fucking Mike Lindell. Yeah, absolutely. What the fuck is... Okay, I have so many questions, but the first is, what is a non-scientific way to kill weeds? Is it serotonin? <laughs> Pray them away. Pray them away. <laughs> which is what mom and dad have apparently been doing. Laying yeah. of hands on the grass. It takes <laughs> ages. <laughs> Their lawn is so big. <laughs> yeah. So apparently George Cooper, the 31-year-old genius scientist when he was a kid, tried to science the weeds out of the garden. And the, the family's like, and then remember when all the toxic fumes came came right into our house and we kind of got brain damage for a little bit. Anyway. Classic humor. Christianity is awesome. My kid has four ears. <laughs> you remember when George invented Agent Orange as a goof, don't you kids? <laughs> oh, it's a good thing he's yeah. a thalidomide baby. Yeah. And the only problem with George, I mean, that was super smart when he did the uh, science weeds thing, but he never accepted the God of the universe. I think that's the problem. <laughs> And that's their dinner conversation again. That's dad just being like, yep, oh he's a, he's an atheist, though, so he's actually dumb. This is how unsubtly they introduce the conflict of this movie. Dad pauses after saying he blew up our yard with 1960s Agent Orange, and then he goes, too bad he's an atheist. I'm glad you kids aren't atheists. And they shuffle back and forth <laughs> guiltily in their chairs. <laughs> and what he says, and by the way, this is the first time I had to pause and rewind. And, and to be clear, this is a 30 minute film and it feels interminable. Like yeah, both times I watched forever. it, I was like, okay, I must be almost over. And I was 10 minutes into it and I like <laughs> almost jumped off my balcony and I live in a town home. I wouldn't have even like died. I would have just like sprained an ankle real bad. <laughs> You're just like, damn it. I can't get out of doing this now. <laughs> For a sprained oh. ankle, you still have to podcast with a sprained Can ankle. That bring was my larynx? I don't know how that works. <laughs> the dad said something. So he, like, this is the first time I had to rewind and go back because I had no idea what was going on. I just, like, zoned out for, like, 30 seconds. And I went back, and it's so fucking boring. And then I got mad at you guys personally. And then <laughs> sure. I wrote down this line, quote, I'm so thankful that neither of you got to questioning things the way he did. And... <laughs> That line filled me with such joy because in writing, we have a thing called show, don't tell. <laughs> and this, I would argue, is the polar opposite. It is tell, don't show. Just give us an exposition dump. Don't make the characters do any heavy lifting with their acting. Oh, that's all of Christian cinema. And for it's sure. so good. We watch dad go through like all the phases of cognitive dissonance. <laughs> he's like, he's probably so smart because he's stupid. <laughs> How could somebody with so many brains be so dumb? <laughs> and then he tries a Bible quote. He goes, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. And it it lands on the table like a fucking dead platypus. And he's mm -hmm. just like, I mean... I guess what I'm trying to say is the only point of science is to make you scared of God. This is not helping. Why? Yeah. <laughs> There's a great moment. He's like, dad, again, dad's like, he's so smart and yet still an atheist. I just can't reconcile that. And then there's a giant pause while the kids look at him. And finally, Joe's like, oh, did you want me to respond to that? Okay. Oh, okay, uh, that was a thing. Yeah, I you, know, you know what? Just say your last sentence again, nice and slow. Maybe you'll hear it. <laughs> no, no. 
I do like, so we've kind of established our villain of this story. And the villain of this story is a guy who runs away from a religiously oppressive town and becomes a PhD and then comes back to the town to help its citizens. Yeah. He's villain. He's the prodigal son who got a PhD. Yeah. That's a good it, the, point. The working title of this was actually <laughs> Thought Loose, but they, you know, they, <laughs> timing <laughs> enough. So now we're going to cut over to the soda shop where Joe and Sid are commiserating about their parents being stupid as fuck. <laughs> yeah. Listen, right. I know. He says, I know what you're going through to Joe. So apparently this this other kid has the same problem, like physics versus honor thy father and mother. It's like a conflict for them. Is that the teenage conflict? Ooh, see, I wrote oh. parents just don't understand the fundamental flaws of the Bible. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is <laughs> this is the saddest <laughs> version of Will Smith and DJ Jazzy Jazz. Thank you. Oh. Thank you for understanding my Will Smith reference. Uh. Absolutely. <laughs> Hey, listen, I understood it. I just didn't laugh that much at it. Okay. okay? Well, Fucking take it easy. <laughs> there's no way to make a Will Smith reference that isn't worthy of great laughter. So, very good point. And I just want to say, I really, really hope that there's a rap version of this being performed at middle schools somewhere in like the oh Midwest. Some troop was like, yeah. we got to do something punchy for the kids. And we'll, they did a 1960s <laughs> propaganda movie and turned it into like, a rapidly rap version of it. Yeah. That's got to be happening. Yeah. And this is where Sis joins them and she brings up the idea that they might want to invite George to come speak at the club. The science club? <laughs> yeah, the science club. <laughs> and this is when Joe's sister, still unnamed, I believe, says, you know what? That's a great idea. I second the motion. And then science club guys like, fuck you. It's woman. amazing. You this movie idiot. grinds to a halt so that, <laughs> so that Sid can be like, you're not in the club. You have a fucking pussy and you know it. And she's like, I was just making a joke. You're right. You're right. Sorry. There might as well be a record scratch and the music might stop. <laughs> well, and the solution that this guy gives this, this head of the science club. Is that, hey, why don't you do twice as much work as any of our members, and then we'll allow you to be an honorary member, yeah. idiot. <laughs> and you're welcome. We'll pay you 70%. How about that? How about that? <laughs> you could be a science club's very special helper. <laughs> <laughs> a science buddy. Like you could be in a science auxiliary. There you go. <laughs> And she goes, well, I know what I can contribute. And I don't know if you guys had this thought, but I was like, she can offer to fuck George Cooper if he speaks at the science club. Because it definitely seems like that's what she's about to offer. It seems like you think that's what she's about to offer. Yeah, I didn't get that at all. I <laughs> okay. If I'm being honest, that's just you. <laughs> Gonna have to well, leave you out there hanging. Maybe Sorry. I watch a lot more vintage black and white porn than you guys do. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. Okay. I'm sorry that I can't watch it unless it's through a slot and I'm in <laughs> inserting nickels every 46 seconds. <laughs> sorry, real quick. Just one other thing about the scene in the malt shop. Joe has a malt in front of him with a very big 1960s straw coming out of it. Fuck yeah, he does. He comes so goddamn close to stabbing himself in the eye with the straw yes, in the seat. What? I couldn't look away from it. It just so many times I was like, it's going to hit him in the eye. Oh, so close. <laughs> it's going to hit him. No, oh, I was rooting. I couldn't listen to the rest of the scene. I was just rooting for an eye stab. Like just while he was gesturing and talking or was he like, did I miss a point where he was just like banging his head against a table? Oh. No, just gesturing, uh, talking. Space work. Yeah, yeah, space work. He just huh. got, he panicked and had to play with the straw a few times. He was so close. If you mute this scene, it looks like a ghost is trying to stab him <laughs> yes. through the table into the <laughs> street. The Joker is behind him being like, want to see a magic trick? That's how the space work of this scene goes. But yeah, she's not going to fuck him. She's going to have him stay at their house. And Joe realizes, hey, if George stays at our house, maybe he'll explain science to their parents and his, their parents will stop believing in God. And I wrote in my notes, oh, you sweet, sweet summer child. Oh, <laughs> yeah. man. We also get one more moment of ridiculous misogyny where they're talking. He's talking with the sister and she's like, oh, you know what? Let's let's invite the atheist mastermind to live at our house. And the waiter of the malt shop comes over and Joe's just like, shut up, shut the fuck up. And then he listens to a saxophone solo, an old time saxophone yeah. solo. And he's like, I'll have a chocolate malt again because that's what it's we all get. Why did they put that in the I don't movie? know why they kept that part. Him just screaming, shut up, hold on. 
I genuinely think they needed to hit that 30 minute mark and we're just like, yeah, this is fine. This is 30 seconds that will get us closer to the mark. Damn it, Susie. Yeah. If we don't have that scene where I order a vault, we're going to be at 22 <laughs> minutes and 34 <laughs> seconds. We'll be a laughing stock, I say. <laughs> Oh, so with that plan in mind, it means it's time to cut over to the kids batting their eyes and asking if George can please stay with them and show them all that there isn't a God. Yep. This movie is more boring than the last movie I watched with y'all, which (laughs) I did not think was physically possible. And yet it might just be here we are. I love it. He's like, they're like, oh, we'll walk him and we'll sacrifice a goat with him and join the Communist Party with him. Please, please, please. We'll feed him. We'll pick up his shit. I prop. Pl- oh, <laughs> come on. I'll pick up the science shit. And at first, mom and dad are a little bit skeptical. They're like, I don't know. It's a, you bring science into your house. I heard that's like vampires. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Is it like vampires? <laughs> yeah, you have to invite science in your house. Otherwise, it can't come in. Right. Yeah, exactly. So they're worried. But they finally sort of agree to it. So science guy is going to come to the house eventually. And and I love dad's objection here. He like turns to the mom and he's like, you sure you'll be up to cook and clean and totally take care of another person? And at no point someone's like, well, we could actually help mom. And they're just like, yeah, mom, are you up to be a servant your entire life until the moment you die? And she's like, oh, I'll be fine. Yeah, at one point later, we see the daughter offer to help make lunch. And it's like the greatest favor she's ever done for anybody. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> at one point, they're still a tiny bit skeptical, but they've agreed to it. And the wife, who also, does she get a name? Oh, God, no. I, I don't, Yeah, if, if the sister doesn't get a name, the wife definitely doesn't. She's even less of a character. Anyway. She's a little bit skeptical and she's like, hey, husband, what if this George science guy corrupts the kids with, you know, like molecules and shit or whatever he does, the atheist stuff. And dad gets all tough here for a second to be like, no, I'm I'm cool. Like, I wish a scientist would say something against God in my house. I fucking wish you would. You'll see. She's like, "Okay, relax. We're having him over. We're going to have him over. Okay, we're going to have him over. And, And then dad says an honest search for the truth never hurt anyone. And I was like, wow, okay. Seems like you'd hear that more often from Christian people. (laughs) That's just another thing that I could hear any like contemporary Christian leader saying. Yeah. And it's 1960. We're going to be doing this for the rest of our lives. Just arguing the same bullshit (laughs) argument forever. This is bleak. Do you hear Christian leaders saying that now? Because like, I feel like they should be saying that. Like, they truly believe it. They should be like, yeah, on a search for the truth. Let's play this game. We're going to win. We're going to beat science with a, t- with a search. But they wouldn't. Yeah, because I think what they have in their back pocket is just intellectual dishonesty. So they don't have to play by the same rules. But <laughs> okay. yeah, I feel like I hear that rhetoric a lot of like, yeah. Yeah, 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 we're all just trying to find the truth. We're all just trying to find the same thing. We're just trying to reach the same answer. And if that answer happens to be that the earth is 6,000 years old and that Jesus died for our sins, then so be it. Actually, <laughs> you know what? I was just I was just recently watching a Matt Powell video. I don't know if you know who that is, but he's an evangelical preacher. Oh. And constantly he's like, I'm poning atheism with facts and logic right now. It's all about the scientific method. And he believes it's on his team. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> I really wanted him to be like, you know, an honest search for truth never hurt anyone. And then the wife is like, so I was thinking about voting. And he's like, not that kind of truth. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. So now that we know everyone's going to be searching for the truth. Capital T. She would have been voting for Kennedy there, by the way. <laughs> that would have been terrifying like an for dad. idiot. Yeah. A Catholic. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> Get out of this house. <laughs> so now some time later, sis comes downstairs to pop scare her brother with the good news that George will be staying with them. <sighs> yeah, she <laughs> she shows up. She walks down the stairs to this basement. Joe's down in the basement. Listen, he's got headphones on. He's listening to a satellite thing. And she's like, okay, should should I tap him on the shoulder? No, you know what? I'm going to do an aggressive pop scare. So she's just like, George is coming yeah. and waves a big piece of paper. <laughs> Joe's face. Like, that was cool. intense. Can we not? Yeah. thought we agreed. You would just <laughs> do taps on the shoulder. Which I'm an astoundingly jumpy person. So the idea of somebody doing this to me is like, I would have jumped into the next room. I would have been very, very angry at my sister for doing this to me. That's yeah. neither yeah. here nor there. Very unpleasant. And she gives him the letter that is apparently from George. That's so like, yes, I'll come speak at the science club. And he unfolds it like it's a playboy. 
I mean, he's uh, he holds it at like <laughs> arm's length and he's up and downing it. Yeah. I got to be honest, several times in this movie, including at the very beginning, this satellite listener radio thing is treated as if porn by the movie a bunch of times. <laughs> the character Joe's like, I wasn't listening to physics. <laughs> like, yeah, like, I, I mean, and that, that tracks, right? Of like, if everything is a sin, then no sin is worse than the other. So like, yeah. in their mind, them talking to a scientist is just as bad as like jerking it to a 1949 Playboy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Those are classy Playboys. Well, whatever. of course. And this is, of course... Where the kids start to have their doubts. Sis turns to the brother here and she's like, I don't know. Should we have made a smart person educate our parents? I don't want to hurt them with the t -t -t truth, <laughs> which, spoiler alert, will be what the rest of this fucking movie is about. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is like, this movie is called Teenage Conflict. All I see is two teenage adults. But two, two, two teenage, teenage thirty year olds, forty something, <laughs> <laughs> trying to like gently educate their parents. Like they're not yelling at them, they're not calling them stupid. They're like, "Oh, my parents are old fashioned," but that's what every teenage thirty year old says about their parents. But <laughs> right. like, they're just trying to like they they're good intentioned. They seem to be ha they have concerns about what their parents believe and want to make sure that they have like well rounded evidence in front of them. I'm not sure if these kids are supposed to be the villain, but they sound like really nice kids. No, they, are. they are. Yes, you're absolutely correct. They're super nice kids. They're absolutely supposed to be the bad guy. The end of this scene is Joe saying, we should help mom and dad become better people, right? Yeah. yeah. The bad guy. End of scene. Right. The message of this movie is like, can you believe these kids wanting their parents to learn things? Assholes. Right. It's genuinely like if you grew up across the street from Neil deGrasse Tyson and he was coming back to your neighborhood and you had parents who were anti-vaxxers or whatever. Now, that's his areas of they expertise. They didn't but believe like, in stars. They didn't believe in <laughs> stars. Thank you. Obviously, that was right there for me and invited over like a well-respected world-renowned person who your parents have a personal relationship with already like i guess it's at worst kind of manipulative but at best just a nice thing to help educate your family right. but it also shows so much about the christian worldview that like hey kids you might find yourself in the position to accidentally teach your parents things <laughs> don't you fucking do it yeah like science is lurking around every corner trying to pants them god <laughs> movie about this like this isn't a casual thing they were like no we gotta warn people against the dangers of exposing their parents to boring space bullshit right? yeah. this isn't like big bang cosmetology refutations of the kalam cosmological argument this is like you want to see how an electron works and they're like i'll fucking kill myself your mother will shoot herself in the mouth if she learns how an electron works <laughs> Well, isn't it so like indicative of the entire Christian worldview is they're always afraid of a hypothetical thing happening. Their worst fear is hypothetically somebody might come in and say, hey, I think evolution is real. And they're like, no. Whereas <laughs> yeah. the rest of us are like, well, I don't know. Your theological beliefs are meaning that I have limited access to like reproductive rights. And they're like, yeah, that's fine. But what if one day somebody comes in and says to my six year old, God isn't real. What am I supposed to do then? And it's like, well, that hasn't happened i don't right. think you know what i don't care what you do then i don't care we're doing my thing yeah <laughs> and that that brings us of course to the problem of as atheists the literal last thing i want to talk about with christians is their religion if, if i'm at dinner with christians that i know and they're like so atheism i'm like let's talk about how we fuck huh i'm a big fan of reverse cowgirl huh because then she gets to do the work up top and i get to just sort of chill down bottom literally anything but this please eli carries pockets full of props for that situation in case he doesn't have a reverse cowgirl speech he's got very distracting things that Magic pop out tricks. of his arms yeah I have said so many times throughout my time podcasting and writing or whatever that like the least interesting thing about you is your Christianity, is your religion <laughs> in general. And that's not to be like rude about religion. I just do not find your religious beliefs that interesting in terms of a conversation topic. Like if that's how you want to live your life, go nuts. But like the idea that like, if you invite me over to your nice Christian household and I'm going to sit there over pork roast and be like, so you believe 
Jesus was dead for three days and then came back. And what do you think about that? That's scientifically impossible. What about the holes in his hands? Like, oh my God, A, it would be the worst. B, I do that conversation all the time anyway. Involuntarily. We do that conversation involuntarily for a living. It's so weird that they would do that. Like at (sighs) dinner and be like, you know what? I was binge reading the Bible again. Let's talk about it. No, what? I literally have a standard speech I need to give to my wife's Christian friends so that they don't even test the waters about atheism. I'm like, hey, why don't we not talk about this? Because this is a thing I've studied a bunch and I don't want to make you upset. And then 40 minutes later, they are crying and someone is mad at me every single time. Yeah, I have made two. Oh, my God. I've made two separate strangers cry in public because they wanted to talk to me about their Catholicism (laughs) specifically. And it's not that I mean to. It's just I'm used to talking (laughs) rapidly and like having supporting thoughts and arguments and they're just a kind person trying to tell me about their religion or uh the flip side you- somebody kind of bludgeoning <laughs> me with their religion and then i say the wrong thing and then they cry now i'm the bad guy for making a strange woman cry in a bar this is a true story that i'm telling and it was part of a work function i <laughs> That's right. You're like a superhero just discovering their power for the first time. <laughs> it, oh my, it was exactly like that. It was exactly like when Rogue first like tries to make out with a boy and fucking kills him, except for like my superpowers. Except they make suck out their except face. weeping instead. instead of dying. Yeah, I make yeah. girls yeah. cry and run to the bathroom, which really makes me sound like a bully. I'm not. I want to be very clear. This was like an hours long conversation that she was having with me, and <laughs> it was uh, there was alcohol involved. That's all we need to. Say. You didn't start it. I did not start it. Like that's the I'm not a bully. I'm rogue. I have superpowers. I can't. It's not my fault. Being an atheist is like having a world where everyone's constantly punching you about the face and neck and the Supreme Court like makes it legal to punch you in the face and neck. (laughs) And once a year, you're like, I wish you'd stop punching me in the face and neck. And everyone's bones fall out of their body. And they're like, how could you? My grandma died. Yeah. And I want to be clear. It's not that I think I'm not speaking for you guys. I don't think atheists are like oppressed widely and largely like there's some weird shit people have said but like just this idea that just who i am is gonna hurt somebody's feelings sucks yeah yeah it's it's like someone's like oh do you like game of thrones and i'm like ah you know i i I like the early seasons and the last season though and then they start weeping Uh that's what it's like to be an atheist the last seasons are amazing you're an asshole you my grandmother was generous she died for you (laughs) Exactly. So now youth pastor guy from the beginning is back to find out what all this nonsense is about, about inviting a science to the science club is about. And the only reason I want to mention this scene is because it could not be more obvious that Fred has been at home practicing how to have a fight with Joe and his (laughs) sister. And this scene, is it going terribly, terribly? He (laughs) might as well have a telemarketer's flow chart in front of him for how this is going to go. And it doesn't go how he likes and he's flipping through and he doesn't know what to do. It's it's pretty great. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that gave me such flashbacks to work in the call center. How upsetting. Oh, Oh. God. Tough. I I had that job for a summer once. Yeah. So bad. At one point, he's like, oh, so what does this George fella do? And he's like, hey, he's building a brain inside a calculator or whatever the fuck it is. You know, science stuff. Yeah. And then without pause or transition, he goes, how does he explain away God? (laughs) This man chose violence (laughs) immediately. (gasps) Yep. And Joe is just like, you you can come and ask him how he explains away God if you want. (laughs) Sid Thorpe flips through his book again and he's like, Nothing. Fuck you, infidel. I will then. I will. I will come in then. Good day, sir. It is literally fighting words the invite to a lecture. He's like, oh, I'll, I'll come to that science lecture and I won't learn anything. I, you, could, you couldn't teach me shit. I will never learn from you. Do you hear me? Never. He might as well scream <laughs> never and jump out the window with a parachute. Um, I kind of want to sort of take a step back and ask you guys, did they, did you notice anybody saying any words besides just science? Like, do they say <laughs> technology? Do they say physics? Do they say, bi- or like, cause genuinely I was trying to pay attention and I, they're just using science as this catch all for everything that's not religion. Oh, absolutely. I have, I have George, whatever his name is, as George science throughout my notes. Cause that's, <laughs> that's what he is. It's yeah. just science, the evil thing. Well, and what's amazing is it's a movie 
about fans of science wanting other people to learn science written by people who have refuse to learn science to the point that they make movies about refusing to learn science. Mm -hmm. So the, their science is like, he makes brains for the computer and science at the science club. That's it. All right. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> what other thing on this scene? Cause we're in the malt shop again for the second time. The malt economy in America was <sighs> fucking booming fucking in 1960. Booming. Everyone could buy a penny stock and a chocolate malt. <laughs> Oh. Was malt like invented in 1958, and that's why that's all anybody <laughs> consumes? We're witnessing the malt boom. Yeah, malt, malt was like, like a malt. side product of fluoride, so they just yeah. had to sell it all over the <laughs> this place. This is the bath salts of, the, of its day. <laughs> yeah, so like whatever, whatever the you know Dow Chemical just had eight billion tons of yeah. malt. Well, it's every like day. how five years ago every drink had to have pomegranate juice in it. That was yeah. that with like malt <laughs> malted. It's like malted beer. The best candy bar you could get was a baby Ruth. It was a different time. <laughs> a simpler time. They're doing, they're doing like pyramid schemes with it, also known as multi-level marketing. Right? Uh, right? Nice pun, bud. <laughs> you did it. Congratulations. Time shares of malt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tried really hard not to laugh at that, but that was good. <laughs> Why would you try to do it? You're such an asshole. Because you didn't laugh at my Will Smith thing. I added to it. Oh my God, Jessica, I'm sorry. I, I, to be fair, I didn't laugh at it. So you're, you're free to withhold laughter from any one of my excellent jokes from here on out. <laughs> Good I would luck. never do that to you, Jessica. You're my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, will you tell Eli he's no longer my best friend? Jessica? <laughs> okay, I'm kind we of into this. Doing this. I am the new of host of God of Awful review. Movies. <laughs> Men are too dramatic to be on podcasts. Yeah. Jessica, will you tell Eli to Jessica, move on? Will you tell Heath that it's time to transition to interstitial too? Daddy, will you tell these boys to shut up? <laughs> <laughs> no, she's not doing it. She's asleep. You're lucky. <laughs> She'll come at you with the fire of a thousand suns. Uh, Dottie, just so everybody knows, is a 75 pound part pit bull and I love her. She her. is the best. If her. you follow me on Twitter or Instagram, basically all I do is post pictures of her. Don't worry. There's, pl <laughs> there's plenty of media to be had. Okay. Well, I'm pretty sure they just cut out several slur words that we don't even know anymore for atheist or <laughs> Jewish or something. And that means it's time for a quick break. And then we'll be back with more A Teenage Conflict. Hey, podcast listener. You know, here on God Awful Movies, we like to do our ads with funny sketches or songs or characters, you know, to make it worth your while and keep you from hitting that plus 15 second button. Because, hey, you might be driving. Eyes on the road. But sometimes we get a new sponsor who's so excellent that the first time we have them on the program, we just like to tell you how cool they are. That's why I'm psyched to tell you that we're working with FitBod. As a fat person, it can be hard to find the time and energy to work out, especially now that I'm a little bit older. I mean, I'm not as old as Heath, but I'm also not 20. Great. Yeah. Glad we worked that in. Thank you. Thank you. And the truth is, exercise is an important part of your physical and mental health. But if you're like me, you don't really have any idea where to begin. The internet's full of crazy people who want to look like a stretch Armstrong full of bowling balls. Personal trainers can be super expensive and the fitness world can be, well... Not super welcoming. Eli once had a personal trainer tell him he needed to be 120 pounds. I did have that, yes. See, now it's a running thing. It's Heath yelling at the ads. So call across the shows, baby. There's a lot yep. of buzz about this. Yes, People it is. People love this. Me yelling from offside of the thing. They do. They do, buddy. So FitBod is an app that creates a fitness program that continually adapts with new exercises and dynamic intensity that adjusts to how you're progressing. So you'll be challenged to meet your goals at your own pace. No equipment? No worries. FitBot has body weight routines for those looking to get fit at home or on the go. And FitBot is super easy to use. Even has HD video tutorials to make learning new exercises a breeze. Plus, it integrates with other fitness and health apps like Apple Health, Fitbit, and Strava. So your cardiologist can stop staring at you like you're on the game show Password and fat is the whammy. I don't think people are going to get that reference. It's, it's contextual. Really he, they'll get it's the reference obscure. to the older. They'll get Probably it not. out of context. And the best part is FitBot is only $9.99 a month or $59.99 a year. Plus, sign up now and you'll get 25% off your membership. Pick up the pace on your fitness journey with FitBod today. And your future self will thank you. Get 25% off your membership at FitBod.me slash GAM. That's 25% off at FitBod.me slash GAM. And hey, while you're at it, friend me on there. You could see how many push-ups I fail at. Don't friend stuff. me though, just Eli. 
Okay, why can't they friend you? I, I don't want them to know how much I squat. Is it because it's a lot? It... No. Are you sure science big scientists will be on the up and up with mom and dad? Why, sure, sis. He's a real straight shooter. You know that. That's him. What's up, bitches? Guess who's here? Not God, that's for sure. Right. Science, uh, about that. Uh, I wanted to talk to you, if that's okay. Sure thing, Nick. I'm not God, so you can talk to me, am I right? Yeah, yeah. It's about mom and dad. Uh, I think they might not be able to handle the whole atheism thing. And mom's been in a real state lately. Yeah, so would you mind going a little easy on the atheism stuff? Well, sure thing, pal. I'll try. Say, is that science I hear? Oh, hey, Mr. O'Malley. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Say, science, are you still up for that sex with me and the wife tonight? Oh, you got it for sure. Fantastic. Hey, I'm mighty grateful. Uh, it's actually called a uh, devil's threesome. Nick, you go to your room. I won't have that kind of language in this house. Uh, but, but I, I, you, you, it sounds like you're no going to do it. No, Mr. Uh, upstairs. Uh, this is not how I expected this to go. And we're back. When we left off, Joe's friends were calling the uh, House Un-American Activities Committee hotline to get him blacklisted for, for communist physics. And now we're going to go back home with mom and dad and we get some bad news. Mom has some kind of lady cancer. <laughs> well, dad comes in and he goes, the doctor says he, she needs an exploratory operation. And I know that those are still a thing and I know that they're not what I'm picturing but I am just picturing a doctor like running a scalpel from mom's forehead to her big toe and just being like, <laughs> take a look in here. Me. I'm going to find it. <laughs> oh, now here's your problem. You're an octoroon. <laughs> That'll do it. I'm not even going to buy. Everybody Sorry. feel feel this dimple right here. You feel that? <laughs> yep. You see this? That's, that's one eighth. Ah. That's one eighth. One dot. One eighth. I'm a doctor. Your problem is you're not pregnant. <laughs> And of course, Joe and and unnamed sister character, they just feel so bad. They're like, oh, mom, gosh, I'm sorry to hear about your lady. It, like, it's so so she says there's an exploratory surgery, but like does not say like, is it in her eyeball or in her butt right or where? in her tummy? Like, no, usually you at least say like lymph node no, or no. lady body U cancer uterine. this is lady body cancer 100 this is 1960 you told your kids that the doctor had some news and then you died the next morning in your rocking chair <laughs> and then she stoically like the good housewife and mother she is is like the doctor told me to rest but instead i'm gonna ignore what he said and do exactly what i've always done i'm gonna <laughs> vacuum four times a day and make you huge <laughs> meals three times a day right yeah I wrote in my notes, oh, I'm not dying. I just need to faint on my fainting couch more often. Yeah. Ooh. And this is when dad is like, all right, well, your mother just needs a little bit of cancer rest. And, you know, of course, a series of professional hand jobs. She'll be fine. You kids <laughs> should make dinner three times total, entirely total to help with the lady cancer. Three dinners and she'll be good. And she'll be good after that, I think. I think the doctor said three dinners worth of, of rest. <laughs> also, the doctor put her on a special diet. Is that a cancer thing? Yep. Yeah. Like, if I have a tumor, is my doctor going to be like, you should cut out carbs? You got to eat In, in 1960, they were like, grapefruit. <laughs> Mangosteen fruit and pomegranate, acai, and malt. You need a lot of malt, too. They didn't know what acai was in the 60s. <laughs> And and then again, to touch on the theme of the movie, mom goes to like faint on her fainting couch or whatever. And dad like hugs both kids. And he's like, don't you worry. God will help us face everything ever. And you both believe what I believe. Don't you kids? And they're like, yep, yep. Totally. Yep. Believe what yeah. you do. No problem here. And, <laughs> and this is when the kids are like, you know what? What if we tell the super smart atheist he can't come live here? And mom's <laughs> mom's like, no, 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 I'll be fine. I will actually play the cancer card against the atheist and I'm going to win that. And it's all good. My cancer has made me strong for rigorous debate. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then she's like, oh, also, I have a real quick cancer speech. God is looking out for us. I Well, OK, except for my cancer right now. I guess that's a weird <laughs> it's a weird thing for me to say right now. You kids might wonder why God gave me cancer. Me too. Fuck. <laughs> Jesus. Wow. Thought this was going to go better when I opened. <laughs> <laughs> think of something on the moment. <laughs> Ow, I fell. I fell and tripped on the problem of evil just now. This is <laughs> tricky. Awkward. Will you vacuum that up, Susie? 
So when she <laughs> comes back from the doctor and says, hey, the doctor used science to take some tests and he was worried about the results of those tests. So he's going to use some further science to just dig in to see what kind of cancer is up in my mm, arm. <laughs> and still, still somehow, this is an anti-science thing. Like, what point is this movie making? Because they know that doctors use science, right? And, like, surgeons, I would say, specifically use science. Yeah. Even 1960 doctor wasn't like, yeah, well, I prayed a little bit. I don't know. Fuck you. Yeah. I've seen the Nick. They just, like, sew somebody's arm to their face and call it a day. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was a really obscure Nick an reference. Excellent. No, no. There's like six <laughs> listeners to who are loving that. To syphilis surgery. Yeah. We need that. And then the, there's there's a, a Venn diagram of the six listeners who liked the Nick reference and the three <laughs> listeners who liked my Will Smith reference. And the ML, there's one guy in the center of that who this is his favorite episode so far. <laughs> So yeah, mom's got cancer. That means Joe is moodily staring at his space radio and darn it, he's not sure if he wants to learn things anymore now that mom is sick. I guess I don't understand the point this movie is making. Like, are they implying that... See, okay, can I, like, punch up this script a little bit? Please, yes. I dare you. Try. <laughs> because yeah. what? what if they had said... Mom was one of the radium girls and now has cancer as a result of that piece <laughs> of like evil technology or like hey, she was go. exposed to something, some sort of radiation that caused a tumor or something like that. So at least we have any weight on the side of science isn't good because they do an OK job of saying God is good and important. They do the thing of she's only hanging on because of because of her religion and things like that. But at no point do they explain besides <laughs> besides the Agent Orange grass situation. That's what I was going to say. That I was just about to say I've just blown this movie wide open. Her cancer is from George Cooper's Agent Orange grass. Oh my God. Oh, yes. They, missed it. they set themselves up to have a better movie and they yep. just missed it. But do you know what I mean? Like they, I, I do, I get the message of here's why religion is important because it gives us morals and it gives us something to lean on when we need it. Fine. Right. Why does that make science bad? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is very mm. unclear why this movie is so terrified of learning things. And again, I can't emphasize enough that like they did not know generally worldview destroying stuff for a mainstream Christian at this point. This is not the Big Bang. This is yeah. not the refutation of the existence of Adam and Eve, though obviously the theory of evolution was out there. But like, th this guy is going to come and talk about computers. If knowledge about computers shakes your faith in God, you had a weird faith in God to begin with. I mean, that's totally like, <laughs> you know, we all have jobs or whatever you want to call this, where we read stories like this over and over of somebody saying like, this kid learned about evolution and now their parents are furious and this is happening. And like, I don't know, like, what are we doing here? Like, why are you so threatened by by science? Because there are plenty of examples of scientists who are Christians and do believe in those the kind of things you do. Like, they're they're setting up this false binary that simply doesn't exist. Yeah. Spoilers. Spoilers. They're going <laughs> to really dig down to that. Right. binary. But they're doing that wrong because they're going to set it up as if science and Christianity don't conflict, but yes, they absolutely do. They could have gone for the softer thing that you're describing there, and they would have been fine, and science could have been good to some Christians, mm -hmm. but no, no. But yeah, the, the point of this conversation is that, like, now that mom is sick, they never really thought of her as a person before, right? Like, yeah. like somehow they never realized that their mom had internal life. They thought she might have been a robot or an automaton. Right. <laughs> And they're scared that science guy is going to like embarrass mom and dad. Like, like science guy is going to, he's going to throw the problem with evil in mom's face when she's got cancer. So they, they have to cancel science guy showing up. That's the fear at this moment. Not just that. They have to secretly cancel it because they can't tell their parents why they're canceling science guy because science guy will kill their God. Oh my God. 
That's the plot of the movie. Like, is it because Christians are told to proselytize and that's why they assume atheists are also going to just constantly talk about atheism? Ooh. Yeah, it's our religion. Yeah, it's our religion of not believing in something. There's an uncut version of this scene where he's like, you know, he's going to declare their marriage invalid and take them to the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> So, meanwhile, mom and dad are upstairs reading the Bible back and forth because this is before we told married people about fucking. So, they're just <laughs> reading it back and forth. <laughs> also, they show us a clock and the the hour hand is wrong. Like, did, in 1960, had they not figured out, like, the smooth hour hand thing? That, like, yeah, moves? I don't think they you quite had it yet. Oh, my God. For some reason, we should have described this kid's basement where he listens to satellites. He has a, a wall of like time zone clocks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we're zooming in on the fact that it's 8 p.m. in Bolivia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's a bull of a clock, I thought. Oh, is that what that is? Yeah. It, what? It's a, it's a, <laughs> it doesn't say Bolivia. It says Bolivia in your notes because... You you just wrote something close to what it said on the on the side of the clock, which was, oh. I think, Bolivar. I thought it, so it's not a wall of time. No. Why does he have more than one clock then? We just see one clock here. I just assumed because it said Bolivar that that was <laughs> Bolivia. Okay. <laughs> Wait, you know what is Bolivar? Does everyone know what Bolivar is? I, yeah, me? Heath, old guy. Is that like your favorite brand of old I guy clock? I don't think that's a, an old guy thing in any way. Noah? I think it's just the name of a company. Eaton. Your like weird yeah, Bul cinnamon Bulova toast crunch. is a watch company. It's definitely hey, a clock hey, made by Bulova. Hey, cinnamon toast crunch is delicious treat for all ages. <laughs> yes, thank you. Important correction. Cinnamon toast crunch is amazing. <laughs> well, on that for a second, everybody just think about it. Okay, so I am wrong about <laughs> the delicious. clock thing, which makes this movie. I, let me say that was one of the only interesting things about this movie. So now we have to talk about the. <laughs> Wait, why, why did you think it would have a Bolivia? Just a Bolivia clock? No, I was like, oh, he's got a wall. You know those news se scenes in movies where it's like a newsroom and it's like, ah, oh, it's eight p.m. in Bolivia and ten p.m. in Hong Kong. Yeah, I, I, I do know. I that. thought this kid had one of those. <laughs> just for Bolivia, though. I'm looking he at Bolivia's science. time zone because maybe Bolivia is the same time zone as like Moscow. Yes. And it's definitely so not. He, and <laughs> listen, listen. We are reaching. We're trying to find some content here. here. Really bit of content. Would, you would work with me for a fucking second. For a second? <laughs> maybe laugh at some Will Smith jokes. <laughs> you fat bitch. <laughs> 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 Jessica, yeah. will you please tell Eli that he is the fat bitch and not me? Listen, we can all be fat bitches. Okay? All right, we're all fat bitches. That's locked in. I like that. <laughs> okay, so at cl clocks aside, clocks and time zones aside, mom is letting us know that, you know, now that she's got maybe lady cancer or at least has to have an exploratory operation, she's really getting into Psalms, you know, just really into psalms and i wrote in my notes mom is going with the most basic bitch of bible passages <laughs> she might as well read love is patient love is kind at a wedding yeah well this is the 60s before any of this is cliche <laughs> i guess yeah her, her cancer was kind of hurting so she's reading psalm 23 that's the one that says Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Take a look at my life in real life. Thank There's you. Nothing left. Oh my God. I was dying <laughs> for them to break into my mind. Oh. Is gone. Gangsta's Paradise. <laughs> Come on. Man yep. who had for the record, it. Heath does have in his notes I am rooting so hard for her to break into Gangster's Paradise. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> I, God, my, my husband and I were just watching a movie recently where somebody started reading that and he and I both just like, yell rap the rest of Gangsta's Paradise and then we had to rewind it because we forgot to pay attention because we were saying how much of the song we could remember. Oh, that's pretty good. We're extremely white in this household. I think, there's, I think there's two kinds of shouting that song. There's the people who go into Gangster's Paradise and then there's the people who go into Weird Al's Amish Paradise. Amish Paradise, yeah. yeah. I, I'll go back and forth between those two actually, yeah. Ooh! Yeah. Interesting. Even my mama thinks that my mind is gone. Go ahead. <laughs> but just as the kids are coming up the stairs, they hear mom saying that facing problems without God is hard. That's why they need to cancel science guy. So everybody in this family wants to cancel, wants to disinvite science guy. And yet 
they're just trudging forward out of spite for each other. Well, what's fantastic is it's like this weird 1950s, early 1960s mannerism thing uh-huh. where they're like, you can't invite someone to a house and uninvite them. We have to burn down the house or kill George and make it look like an accident. <laughs> Oh, boy. And also, like, I did not grow up in a Christian household. Is this a thing that Christians actually do is, like, just sit and read the Bible to each other? I guess. I don't know. I grew up Jewish. We certainly don't read the Torah back and forth to each other. It's just the thing is, like, I'm... I've rewatched Superstore three times in the last, like, four months, and I'm really embarrassed about that. But the fact that there are some people who just read the same book over and over and over out loud every night until they die (laughs) makes me feel a little bit better about my viewing habits, because at least Superstore is (laughs) pro-union. I read Harry Potter to myself, so it's totally normal Mm -hmm. that I read it over. Oh, for about 10 years, my husband and I watched The Simpsons every night to fall asleep. So there you go. And to be fair, we did talk about The Simpsons a lot. So maybe it's not that they just believe in this stuff really hard. It's just always in their noggins. Nice. Yeah, Yeah, it's the the Bible is the office to Christians who just keep (laughs) cycling through it. Oh, oh man, there's a lot of comparisons there. They can't stop quoting it. Uh-huh. They ignore the problematic elements of it. They think it's a substitute for personality. The British one is probably <laughs> better. There's a, I'm mm. making a lot of connections this year on God Awful Movies. <laughs> <laughs> We're pattern-seeking people, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but this this conversation about Psalms ends with mom being like, so I don't even get, like, what do people do about having cancer without you know, a living faith in the living God. And then they pan over to Joe. He's like in the next room listening to this. And he's like, mostly medicine is what they do about the cancer. <laughs> Should I jump in and correct? No, I'm not going to jump no, in and correct right this, now. This, no, 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 no. This isn't the time. This isn't the time. It does seem like they really <laughs> want to know that. No, no, I, you know what? I'll let it. No, read the room, read the room. Dad does these rhetorical question things. Every time I answer, it's, it's not a good idea. He never really wants me to answer. <laughs> I ha- Note to self, look up what rhetorical means. <laughs> <laughs> and then one more time, we're going to cut back to the kids who realize that they can invite George to the house now because he won't just insult his parents. He'll kill their mother with the knowledge of science. <laughs> and they show us this by aggressively clearing the table. It's so good. <laughs> Of of milk and butter was their meal this time. They didn't have the savory milk jello. Milk and butter was their meal. They had glasses yeah. of milk and a stick of butter. <gasps> Did people table. used to drink milk with meals? Yeah, that was standard, I think. For, still I think do. Some people still do that. Like, yeah. That's a really? Midwest thing, yeah. We've had a milk oh. gate or two on this podcast where people do or do not drink entire glasses of milk as a refreshing beverage. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I'll... No, 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 no. And I'm in the Midwest. But you're in that like pocket called Chicago that's like sort of not really. Yeah, but we have a lot of Midwest sensibilities. (laughs) When was the last time you had popcorn mayo salad? Popcorn mayo salad is not a thing is the problem yes, it with that. Really it's, is. it's a thing. It, Heath has brought it up on the last four out of five it's of our podcasts. It's terrifying and it's can't real. Stop thinking about it. It's the whitest nightmares. thing about me is that I love mayonnaise. So I really wish you hadn't said that because now <laughs> it's just gonna dwell in my brain until I inevitably try it and well, love it and then become morbidly <laughs> obese because I have no self control. I have a girl in the farm clip to send to you when this recording is over. <laughs> Oh, shoot. I meant to send you guys a picture of my dog during the break. Damn. I'll do that later. Oh, please do that. But yeah, the kids are so concerned during this scene in the movie. I legitimately, and I want to know what you guys thought. I legitimately thought they were going to plan to murder or otherwise waylay George so he didn't kill their parents' fame. Right. The point is here that like, if they tell science guy to not actively debunk Christianity to cancer mom, he's going to be like, fuck you. Nothing happens when you die. Good luck with that cancer. (laughs) That's what the movie's telling us. Exactly. Well, they're just presenting this incredibly low stakes situation as extremely high stakes. And, like, that just feels like a shortcut around lazy writing. But, like, there's a solution. There's, like... Eight solutions I can think of off the top of my dome. Just like explain to the guy the situation. Ask him not to specifically talk about religion. It's a really touchy topic in our house. 
disinvite him and everybody's fucking fine because he's a grown ass man. He can probably find a place to sleep. Like (laughs) there are solutions on the table that aren't like panicking in the kitchen over your butter and like trying to make a sneaky like, oh, how are we going to covertly disinvite this guy without... I mean, that's not even hard to do. Just call the guy, say, hey, we had a family emergency like my mom had cancer, so please don't come. Tell the mom, oh, the guy called and canceled. Like, there you go. That's it. We solved this conflict. We got you a room at the Howard Johnson's. You get some orange ice cream. It'll be great. (laughs) The best part is they literally have an excuse, which is that their mom is sick. And they're like, but what will we say? What will we say? And it's like, well, your mom's getting an exploratory surgery. And they're like... We need to put a car bomb underneath this plane. They have yeah, no but choice. he's not going to acknowledge that she's a real person with feelings because she's a woman and all she's meant to do is make us dinner and clean our house. If we tell him that she has cancer, he's going to remember she's a physical being with hopes and dreams of her own. And we can't have that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, it looks like it's going to be science just in general. Science versus, well, science and cancer versus God. So... Cliffhanger. Wait, do you think they're implying that the only reason she thinks she has cancer is because we have the technology to detect cancer and she would just frankly rather not know and die a slow, painful death yeah, like we did like in the a, good old days? I think it's like a Schrodinger's cat they, thing. They, and it's science's fault for looking in the box. This film is shown to doctors about not telling people when they have cancer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's what's happening. Science and cancer versus God. There we go. But before we find out what happens, we're going to take one more quick break. And then we'll be back with what I'm certain will be a very much intellectually honest conclusion of (laughs) a teenage conflict. (laughs) Well, hey there, Heath. What is the matter? Oh, hey, Internet. The guys keep making fun of me for turning 40. It's kind of bumming me out. I bet. Well, would you like some anonymous medical advice in the form of a Tumblr post on Facebook? No, no. I know you're normalizing that kind of thing under the guise of awareness or self-care, but it's actually super dangerous and contributes to the stigma around mental health care? Yeah, I guess so. Well, how about some Christians pretending to be a mental health resource? Nah, that's like the third most evil thing. So, no. Say, Internet, you don't have any good mental health care, do you? I sure do. Have you heard of BetterHelp? What's BetterHelp? What? No, no, absolutely not. This is stealing. No, it's a callback. Callback to the other end. He is right. That's a pretty good callback. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional therapy done securely online. Wow, mental health advice from a medical professional. That sounds great. I'm off to the side now, too. Plus, BetterHelp has a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. So if you need a therapist who is secular, trans-affirming, or queer-friendly, they can help you find someone. So question, what if, like, a you know, a certain point-stealing co-host... I don't like my therapist. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change therapists if needed. And BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline therapy, and financial aid is available. Plus, God Awful Movies listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash awful. All right, where do I sign up? Well, BetterHelp.com slash awful. That's better H-E-L-P, and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. All right, Noah, I'm in. Proud of you for getting the help you need, buddy. Eli, don't steal a segment. I don't know, man. People are talking about it. A lot of no, buzz. It is no, no, there's no buzz. People, I haven't heard any buzz. People are loving this. Okay, I call this meeting of the Christian Science Club to order. What's his name? Now, as you know, we try to keep our speakers and meetings only to Christian topics in science that doesn't fill with religion. So who should we get this year? Well, uh, say, what about a biologist? I don't know. They might start talking about evolution. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, oh, they can't do evolution. Have that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, what about uh, an astrophysicist? Maybe. Is there one we could invite who won't say anything that will conflict with the stars falling out of the sky during the apocalypse or the earth unrolling as God creates it? Ah, yeah. Probably not, actually. Yeah, I don't think good so. Good point. No. Huh. huh. You guys just want to invite a guy to talk about eugenics again? Yeah, eugenics. That sounds good. Good, good. Third year in a row. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> hey, thanks so much for coming on the show, Jessica. No problem, guys. Hey, while we've got you, and, and feel free to say no if you can't spill the beans on this, would you mind sharing some of your 
friendly secrets with us? My friendly secrets? Yeah, yeah. You know how like you and Hammond are on friendly atheists together. Like, um, how do you make that work? Yeah, friendly. I mean, we talk about religious news, just like you guys do unscathing. Right, right, right. Yeah, but but how do you do it friendly? Friendly, exactly. That's ridiculous to me. Can you give us an example? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um. So let's say Pastor Greg Locke says something horrible. Right. Mm. He looks like a testicle that got arrested at the January 6th riot. Ha <laughs> <laughs> does look at the testicle. Good one. Right. See, you don't say that when you're telling the story. Okay. But like we imply it like... Greg Locke, who who looks like he should be hanging off the body of a man about to tase him as he tries to steal a painting like that. Like Ooh, we would say, it, like subtle. It kind of imply it no, subtly. No, no, no. Uh, you just don't compare him to a testicle at all. What? Oh, because there's a better insult. You got a better one. Oh, okay. But I thought the testicle was a pretty good one. It is no, pretty good. You can build no, on it. No, no, right. no. You just read the news. Like, Pastor Locke said X. Pastor Locke said X. Exactly. Fuck his face. Fuck his face, yeah. You know what? Why don't you guys stick to the scathing thing and we'll stick to the friendly thing? Well, I, Sounds good. How do you not say he's a testicle, though? Yeah, I don't get it. Just look with your eyes. Yeah. And we're back. When we left off, an atheist was on his way to the house to yell at Cancer Mom, and it was too late to stop him. And now he's finally arrived at the house, and he's taunting Mom about the afterlife in the other room, or so... <laughs> We're led to believe. <laughs> he comes out. George comes out and Joe sees that like, oh, God, he's already inside the house. It turns into a horror movie for a second. <laughs> I genuinely thought Joe was going to side tackle George and be like, no, Jesus is real. Don't tell my mommy. <laughs> yeah, that's the tension we get. But George walks back out of the kitchen and he says hi to Joe here. And we learn that George, back when he was the neighbor kid, taught Joe, quote, all those marble trick shots. Now, I know this is like completely unrelated to the plot of the movie, but they have trick shots in what is marbles? In fact, I I realize I don't even know exactly how that game. I know you flick marbles and there's like a circle and you knock some out or whatever. Yeah, we need our resident old guy here because Noah would absolutely be able to tell us all the marble trick shots. Oh, I bet he would know how the marbles were right. And he'd know which ones were good and which ones were bullshit. Jessica, have you ever played marbles? No, I did, went through a short jacks period when I was a friendless young person. Jacks? <laughs> That's the bouncy ball and you grab the, the metal jacks mm-hmm. from the ground? Yeah, you got it. You got it, my oh, friend. That one I know how to play. You bounce it and you see how many jacks you can pick up before you catch the ball. That's the game. And I was not good at it. <laughs> well, let me throw this out there about jacks because jacks is a wonderful game in that when you play one and two, you have this like nice little hand motion of like, wah. but then as you get into the higher numbers, you just look like some kind of cartoon Italian trying to pick up spilled meatballs. I'm sorry. So it really turns into a. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I have to say I'm half Italian um, and that's a pretty accurate depiction of how I pick up my meatballs. <laughs> oh, okay. exactly. All right. yeah, yeah. I was about to object, you know, on behalf of the Italian people. No, but no, no. I'll yeah. represent the entire Italian people here. No, I have a list of ethnicities that I'm still allowed to make fun of, stapled to my computers. And that's a standard there. stereotype that Italians are really bad at quickly picking up metal objects. Everybody <laughs> fucking knows that. <laughs> They're meatballs. Yeah, exactly. OK, whatever. <laughs> so marbles, jacks that they're definitely playing both of those games in 1960 and they're killing God with science. Mm-hmm. Eli, go ahead. And Joe tries to distract him. He's like, oh, uh, hey, speaking of that, why don't you come down into the basement and help me with the satellite tracking gear? And mom for a second's like, oh, don't bother George with that. We were just about to talk about the Bible. And I want him to be like, tackle again. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful because he's trying to cover it like George has drugs to sell him. Right. He's like, I have questions about um Science and not God, not God. I don't want to talk about that. Not concerned about God, not a problem. I have to ask you these questions in a different room, though, please. Je- no, <laughs> you just George. To. Everybody raise your hand if I said your name just now. <laughs> Great. Everybody with their hand up, come with me. Yeah. Everybody without cancer is allowed to come into the basement for the science job. <laughs> Everybody who's been named in this movie is allowed to come downstairs. <laughs> But mom's mom gives in and she's like, OK, but George, don't molest him. And George is like, all right, scouts honor. I won't. <laughs> so now we flash cut. This is how lazy this movie is. Now we flash cut to George 
having explained the stupid plot of this movie and asking George not to kill mom's God. And I was so mad because I really wanted to see the conversation where Joe was like, hey, uh, George, I got to ask you a favor. Could you not tell my mom any new things? Yeah. Uh, The thing is, like, this all, if, if you, if it's in the certain kind of light, none of this is even a conflict let alone worthy of writing a movie about like no. hey dude can you chill on this thing yeah yeah no problem man <laughs> that is this movie <laughs> but <laughs> this movie has an even better reveal than yeah why would i upset your mother in a conversation she didn't bring up because <laughs> at this point george might as well pull off his face like a mission impossible movie and go don't you see i've been religion all along <laughs> I yelled bing bong at my TV at two in the morning when I was watching this. I was like, here we go. Bing bong. Yeah. So clearly Joe was like, hey, can you pretend that there's a God for my cancer mom? And George Science was like, no, (laughs) but let me finish my big reveal. That's because there is a God. I'm a super genius. I made a supercomputer brain. There is, in fact, a God. That's the big <laughs> twist here. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, I know this is surprising because I know things, but I'm religious now. <laughs> and he's like, oh, really? Why are you religious? And he's like, well, um, being an atheist in the 1960s fucking sucks. So that's the first <laughs> yeah. reason. <laughs> Fair. I lost so many jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and then Joe keeps arguing back he's like no no no. but you said science and religion contradict each other when you did that interview remember that and george <laughs> science is like no 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 they took that out of context i said science and religion won't agree until both sides are nicer about it yeah i said i wrote in my notes i said religion and science conflict until science surrenders to religion <laughs> Well, I also like that he is quoting himself off the top of his head. Like, he has this <laughs> locked and loaded, and I kind of wish I made myself a few pithy quotes I could just have in my back pocket. And, like, and, and, and like not just say them and pretend I made them up, but quote myself. Like, you know how I always say, religion in the eye, science in the brain, bing bong. <laughs> Ooh. Um, guys, I was not an improviser. I was a stand-up. I'm sorry. That was garbage. <laughs> if you would like to buy your religion in the eye science in the brain t-shirt we are selling it for a very <laughs> reasonable price what do you think my brain was trying to make out of there i think it huh? was a sex thing it sounds like a sex thing I, i'm sure i'm yeah okay sure it's a sex thing i'm fine <laughs> with this no notes <laughs> <laughs> no feedbacks <laughs> but this is where we're going to get the like apologetics lightning round oh and these boy. are my friends these are 1960s apologetics these are unshaven. Slash a lot of them still, if somebody said this quote today in the shape of a 20, you know, a 2021 person, I'd be like, oh, yeah, that sounds like the same thing they've been saying for my entire life. <laughs> and apparently, sounds like something Pastor Locke says when he's crying outside the doors of a Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> that won't let him in. <laughs> yeah. So one of those terrible apologetics was. There can only be one ultimate truth. That's what George Science says here. And like, I don't even know what that even means. That's not like, what are the second tier truths in your head? If even <laughs> if you're trying to say God's the only one, but there's not other true things. Yeah. yeah. He keeps saying things that are very obviously true and then being like, but actually, no. So he does too. He goes, uh, I grew up believing in proof, but not anymore. And then he says, a fact is a fact or it isn't. And then he's like, no, no, it's not. There's a middle of factiness, I guess. There's a, there, he has a spectrum. Now he's seen the light. He has a spectrum of factualness that he would like to tell us about. Yeah, I will say the one thing he said that I was kind of on board for is he said there's there can be more than one approach to truth, which I think is sort of a nice way to put things in theory until, you know, you kind of shine a light on it and realize that one of them is just making shit up and the other is like verifying <laughs> right. it. But like, I think it's a nice thing to say to Christians to make them feel that they're also part of the science game. Yeah, I guess. There's more than one approach to building houses. There's hammers and nails and there's shitting and wishing that a house grows out of your butt hole. Yeah, I mean, there's See? like science and then like Christianity is like shake and bake helping on the side. Like if you could just not <laughs> get in the way, that'd be great. You can pretend you're you're in the same room. I don't know. But Joe argues back. He's like, okay, but you know, I thought a fact is a fact. Isn't truth binary? And <laughs> 
George Science is like, no, it is not binary. I'm a super genius. Yeah. But wasn't that just a binary statement about the truth just now that he made in response to the question, isn't truth binary? Yeah, when he gives that answer, I wrote in my notes, truth isn't just from your mind. It's the friends we made along the way. <laughs> and this is where we get, I got to say, it has been a while since someone has trotted out this apologetic in one of our movies. The do you love your mother argument of the yeah. existence of God. Yep, 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 yep. And he even messes this one up, right? Because the whole thing is like, oh, you know, you can't prove that love exists or whatever that means. And, and yes, you can. He messes it up. He says, you can't measure how much you love someone. And I'm like, I mean, you probably could. You, you probably could. And also self-reported. I would like to uh, to quote the great Tim Minchin and say that love without evidence is stalking. <laughs> <laughs> he also explains that there's more to the world than real stuff and that that stuff is just as real as the real stuff. Almost Fuck, exact quote. Fucking argue with that, nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how that doesn't fit in your little tiny box. <laughs> and Joe comes back to him and goes, okay, but how can you prove it's real? And he goes, there's a ton of proof. His first piece of proof, God speaks to your heart. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That if you believe in Jesus, you know that the things you believe about Jesus are true. But again... Uh, this doesn't refute science is no. the problem. Well, no. that's the next apologetic point is that Joe's like, OK, but what about the conflicts between the Bible and science? And George is like, oh, um, science is wrong. Science is probably wrong. Scientists <laughs> used to think the world was flat. Oh, boy. Oh, that old chestnut. Um, <laughs> this is where I wrote in my notes. I keep zoning out. Why did you make me watch church? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All of the examples he gives of scientists being wrong about space stuff are things that scientists believed because of the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. They thought the world was flat because the Bible <laughs> indicates point. that the world is flat. They thought the sun revolved around the earth because the Bible indicates that the sun revolves also, around the earth. Also, he's saying science is bad because we need to do more science. That's nonsense. I mean, but like, honestly, the the argument of, well, if science is real, how come science keeps changing is not only like a bad argument, but it's really tr like a troubling look into the in like into the intellectual capacities of a Christian apologist, because what they are saying to you at that very point is, I do not care what I see or experience or what happens to me or what anybody else says. I am going to believe this thing until the day I fucking die and nothing you can do will change my mind. And like, that's not a great stance in life, arguably. Not just nothing you could do to change my mind, but when people discover true things, I will assume they are doing them incorrectly until right. they match my worldview. Oh, well, I mean, that's just, <laughs> oh boy, that's what being a woman on podcasting is like. <laughs> Anything I say, men will be like, it's probably wrong. I'm just not sure why yet. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get one of Ray Comfort's favorite arguments. I got a little nostalgic here. The banana? Oh, God, I wish it was the banana. No, it's the, the banana. You can't make a complicated thing by chance. Therefore, the universe was created. And the example George gives of this, he's like, you know, this satellite listening rig. And he's like, yeah. And he's like, what if you took all the pieces and shook them together in a box? They would not make a big satellite listening rig, would you? And I wanted so badly for Joe to be like, I mean, if you shook the box for eternity and yeah. the natural laws pointed all the pieces to forming a satellite listening rig, then yes, they would. But but he's just like, gosh, what a great argument. But like. It's such a fundamental misunderstanding of evolution because the the screws and nuts and bolts and other sciencey things don't have agency and aren't being hunted or like trying to <laughs> right. create like trying to survive. They're just inanimate objects. They know that like even bugs aren't inanimate objects, right? Like to to say that evolution doesn't work because it's like as if throwing a nut and a screw at each other and hoping they twist together. It's like, well, I don't know if them twisting together means that they probably won't die. Then 
maybe that would happen, but that's not what we're talking about. Like, a machine isn't an evolutionary being. They know that, right? You have, they have right. to know this. I don't know that they don't know that. <laughs> and if you shake up a box of words, you will get Hamlet eventually. But if you shake up, like you said, you know, animate evolution stuff gets shaken up for b- billions of years. You do get literally Hamlet. You get William mm-hmm. Shakespeare <laughs> and you get fucking Hamlet. We experience And that. we literally get shaken up from time to time. There's earthquakes. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's literally true. <laughs> yeah. You do get Hamlet. That's so cool. You actually do get <laughs> Hamlet. You get the literal <laughs> Francis Bacon's Hamlet. That happens. Francis <laughs> Bacon's <laughs> Oh, boy. I'm sweating from laughing so hard. <laughs> sort of where I am. All I wanted at the end of this was <laughs> was for Joe to pull off a mask like Scooby-Doo and, and George Science is Ray Comfort dressed as a scientist. Uh, oh, I wanted, I thought you were going to say he pulls off the mask and he's been Fred the whole time from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I know you'd only listen to George. It's a shark all of a sudden, yeah. <laughs> he just starts flopping around <laughs> I'm just curious uh, if a Christian person, like an earnestly Christian person, watched this today. Because to me, this feels like the exact same bullshit as I've been like reading about, like the apologetics I've been reading about my whole life. And I'm very curious if I got in like a, a you know, ha- hashtag true believer, if they would watch this and be like, yeah, this all stands. I, I disagree with none of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting when you can watch a black and white film and your worldview is reflected, isn't it? <laughs> they, they'd have to agree. They'd have to be like, yep, this still this holds up. This is a great movie then and now. Yeah. And he concludes this little section, George does, by explaining that the meaning of life is believing in Jesus. And I was talking about this before the record a little bit. I don't know why I've been having a bunch of realizations lately on this podcast. But like when I watched this movie, I realized oh my gosh, that's actually what Christians think the meaning of life is. They think the meaning of life is to read a 3,000-year-old book about a Palestinian rabbi and then just be like, I'm psyched about that dude until they die. Mm-hmm. I was, I my notes literally say, that's so stupid, I'm staggered by how fucking stupid that worldview is. Yeah. <sighs> Your job is to watch movies about this worldview. I know, but it, it apparently it took 200 and however many of them. It took 300 and yeah. however many of them before that message got across. This break, you. All right. So with Joe fully convinced of God existing based on those four really badly constructed apologetic arguments, it's time for our final scene. And the family is gathered around because darn it. They learned something today. <laughs> we get a little more of the, the sitcom music. And this is a great ending. I laughed a lot in this final scene. <laughs> so they all walk downstairs to the satellite radio thing. And, and they're all asking like, oh, did the satellite prove that God's real? And did you listen to Sputnik and Sputnik's talking to God? And Joe says, okay, well, I still, I still can't hear anything. And then dad is like, I want to try. And he does hear something because he moves the one dial to the hearing part of the dial and he hears something. And I was like, oh, is it God? Can we, the audience, hear it, please? We cannot. We cannot. And then mom tries and she's like, I can hear something too. So apparently there's, what What did they hear? What do you think they heard? So, well, this is the best part. What they hear is beep, beep. Because that was all Sputnik was putting out. So these people are losing their minds about a beep, beep, beep from space. <laughs> I just identified a really big hole in this script. Oh, did you Ooh. find one? <laughs> Take us there. Take us there. You found an inconsistency <laughs> in this script, Jessica. <laughs> Not to say the rest of it was airtight. <laughs> sorry, Please I just proceed. realized. <laughs> I just realized that... <laughs> Their conclusion is, oh, we can hear Sputnik. Was anybody doubting that Sputnik existed? Like, we're not, like, what the fuck are they talking? We know Sput, like, we know there's a satellite up there. We know the Ruskies put it up there. Like, it's not like they 
saw like a speciation between two bre- two kinds of mosquitoes. They just saw a fit. <laughs> like it's literally like if some if one of them was like, oh, I can. <laughs> I can hear pilots talking to each other. I guess flight is real. Like, that wasn't up for debate at any point. Oh, but you know what? This movie should have been about a telescope that they couldn't get working. And then yes. at the end, she's just like, I guess the moon is real after all. 12,000 yep. times better. Because all they had to do was like, oh, I hear there's supposed to be a shooting star at this point and at this time. Oh, we should all try to see it. And then how do they know? Well, it's old knowledge. Well, the Bible is old knowledge. No, this is different old knowledge and it's based on scientific fact. Well, the, the Bible is. And then at the end, we all see this shooting star or meteor shower or a borealis or whatever. And everybody's like, wow, science is beautiful. That is what this movie should have been. Not is Sputnik real. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the movie ends here by saying like the message they're giving us is, Sputnik was talking to God, right? Like Sputnik had to get a little bit closer to the firmament or whatever. And now God's up there talking with Sputnik over a radio. I don't know. Okay. I'm so glad you said that because it's the line mom said. She's like, I wonder what they're hearing out there. And then Joe has like a nodding, like, a, oh, I think I know what they're connecting with moment. Right. It does very much seem like they're like, I wonder if Jesus is giving them pointers. Yeah. Right. Do they think Jesus lives in outer space like an alien? <laughs> no, this would be a, that would be a Mormon movie. Jess. That would yeah. be a Mormon, movie. <laughs> Mormon hadn't even been invented in the 1960s. <laughs> I know that's not true. Don't at me. <laughs> Or it could just be God talking to the mom, being like, sorry about that cancer. That was my bad. Oh, uh, my, my, my bad. bad. Beep, beep, beep. This is awkward. I didn't think I was going to see you here. Oh. Um, sorry oh. about that cancer. I'm going to do something super mysterious. I promise. I'm going to turn this into like a really cool, <laughs> yeah. mysterious way. You're going to have a dope deathbed revelation. It's going to be <laughs> out of this world. I would also like to speak briefly about the the uh, dialogue in this and not the dialogue, but their use of idioms specifically. Please take us there. They they say two things that make me think they don't understand how language works or something. First of all, he said, I was way out of orbit, which isn't an expression, but is nope. sort of a science pun. <laughs> and then wordplay three different times characters say, oh, he's going to talk your arm off uh, several times. <laughs> That's not an expression I have ever heard. It is definitely not. It's very confusing. The expression is, I'll talk your ear off, because an yep. ear is what you use for the listening half of a conversation. Mm-hmm. Your arm shouldn't be that involved in their conversation, unless definitely. you're an Italian like me, and you use your hands to you, do the talking. You can't even that pick up jacks. It's ridiculous. <laughs> pick up jacks with your ear like an idiot Italian. Uh. <laughs> You, you spill your meatballs. Exactly. Okay. Full circle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's the end of the movie, I guess. So what was the teenage conflict? This was another question I've really been praying about. It's really been in my heart and mind. <laughs> okay. And I genuinely do not understand because the primary conflict is unrelated to them being teenagers and it's not a conflict between teenagers unless you're talking about our main guy in shark face right but that's i wouldn't call him our big bad i would definitely call john scienceman our big bad i don't know y'all i don't i genuinely don't know what this i i don't know what this was about and i've watched it twice and it's only a half hour and i do not understand it See, I was going to say the teenage <laughs> conflict is whether or not to tell your dying mom about electromagnetics. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard I one. I guess. <laughs> but even then, the electromagnetics are not going to shake her face. I'm just so confused about everybody's concern. Maybe <laughs> the whole problem with this movie is they think their mom is a fucking idiot and are protecting her. And she's really like, no, 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 it's fine. I'm a 1960s housewife. I'm doing my best. But, you know, I just have these things that help me along. They're like, don't give mom any extraneous information. Her head will explode. <laughs> yeah. Don't teach your mom things or she'll die of cancer. <laughs> a teenage conflict. What's next? She's not going to wear pearls vacuuming? Uh, never. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for our review of a teenage conflict, but that's not going to do it for the episode just yet. We've got another terrible movie for next week. Eli, what's on deck? We'll be watching Elizabeth's Gift. It's the story of a ghost daughter's mission 
to get her parents to start a foster care about Jesus. It's unclear from the trailer, but there's definitely a dead kid in there somewhere. All right. Well, with that to look forward to, we're going to bring the episode to a merciful close. Huge thanks to Jessica for joining us. And Jessica, where can everyone hear more from you? You can find me every week on the Friendly Atheist podcast, which drops on Fridays usually. Or another podcast I'm kind of wrapping up right now is Cooper Duper. It is a Twin Peaks podcast I did with my husband. Yes. That is, yeah, um, <laughs> my husband is a like diehard Twin Peaks fan, and I've also seen it. And um, we got <laughs> bored about a month into quarantine, and so it's just an episode by episode breakdown of what Twin Peaks is about, and it's meant to be. It can be for if you've seen it a million times or for you're trying to watch it for the first time and piece what's happening because it is a befuddling show. But we just finished season three, so they're all up there for your binging pleasures. We're going to move into some David Lynch movies, but it's just something that's really fun and I'm really proud of. Fantastic. You're talking a ridge Twin Peaks, like 1990 Twin Peaks, right? Both. We did. So we did the first two seasons and then we just finished The Return, the 2017 third season. Nice. Okay. Nice. Which is crazy <laughs> fantastic and of course a big thanks to our patreon donors for all the generosity if you'd like to help support the show you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash god awful and then i'll get you early access to an ad free version of every episode you can also help us out by leaving us good reviews and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms and if you enjoyed this show be sure to check out our sibling shows the scathing atheist citation needed the skeptocrat and D minus available in all the podcast places if you have questions comments or cinematic suggestions you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slonick of Evil Drafts on Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Jessica and Eli, I'm Heath, promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Animal House clothes. God created the science that is healing your mom, but not that other science. <laughs> <laughs> God's first words to Sputnik 2 and the human race were, is that a fucking burned up corpse of a dog? What did you just do? <laughs> God killed these children's mom with painful colon cancer, but at least he did it without her ever having a mildly unpleasant conversation about religion. <laughs> Sorry about that. I drank. I, I inhaled a little bit of coffee when I took a sip just now. <laughs> Give me a second. <clears throat> okay. Morgan, please send me that audio. Absolutely. Do not send the Zoolander cough. Coughing. Do like not the send the really Zoolander charming. cough. No. That should be the intro music no. for this episode. Morgan, how dare you even consider <laughs> Morgan, listen to me. Did you have the black long bud? I'm sorry. <laughs> Who's winning the match? Okay. Here we go. Scrolling. Scrolling. I first. was there first. First. Nope. 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 I don't know. I was clearly there first. Me though. Jessica. I'm here. Who was there I'm first? Here. <laughs> I'm here. I did it. Adjudicate. Oh, I wasn't paying attention Objective. to you guys. It was I was doing my own thing. Tough but fair. That was me. All right. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Dottie agrees it was me. Dottie so agrees. Sorry. Okay. Got that third. Could, oh, just worry, one man. second. I yeah, just no have to murder my dog really quick. <laughs> hey, Dottie. <laughs> The irony of that bit is my catchphrase on the podcast is fuck that guy. So <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess it's not that friendly. There you go. <laughs> no, That's I'm good. not. You brought some not friendly to the friendly there atheist in yeah. a very good way. That's important. That's sort of my my role there. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.